At the beginning of the 20th century, many physicists believed the completion of physics was near. Only a few minor issues needed to be sorted out, and all of physics would be known. The Newtonian deterministic universe would finally be understood. But this was radically changed when the subatomic world was studied in depth. Max Planck calculated that electrons could only radiate in chunks of energy, or in quanta, instead of gradually losing energy over time. Each quantum or chunk would suddenly radiate from the electrons, seemingly without cause or an impressed force. The discovery of these quantum leaps began the beginning of the strange study of quantum mechanics. How could these quantum jumps just suddenly happen instead of a gradual decline over time, like what we would intuitively expect? Later on, quantum jumps were found in more and more places, and in more ways. Matter acted far more bizarrely than we expected. Discoveries and equations formulated to explain the bizarre quantum world began to baffle physicists. The universe did not seem to be fundamentally deterministic at the bottom level, but probabilistic. The mathematics essentially described that particles would exist in a state of a wave function, which is nothing more than a mathematical probability of multiple possible states of where the particle could be. But upon measurement from an observer, the wave function would collapse to one position. But that implied outside observers were necessary to collapse the wave function and bring about the physical existence of the fundamental particles that make up reality, which many scientists philosophically could not accept. How could outside observers be responsible for the actual result and the collapse of the particle instead of us simply observing nature to see how it behaves on its own? How could the most fundamental particles of nature be dependent on our observations instead of just acting independently. The famous double slit experiment reveals how odd the rules of quantum mechanics are. Physicists were interested if particles acted like waves or little balls of matter. Using a single slit and double slit experiment, we can determine how they behave. For comparison, when balls are shot through a single slit, they would create a single band on the other side where they land. And when they are shot through a double slit, they would reveal two bands on the other side. However, when a wave goes through a single slit, it would reveal a wave-like pattern with intensity in the middle. And when several waves go through a double slit, they interfere with each other, creating an interference pattern. So shooting particles through a double slit should reveal if they act like waves or particles. In various double slit experiments, particles were fired through a single slit, and the results revealed that particles were acting like waves. The particles go through both slits and the wave-like properties interfere with each other, causing an interference pattern. However, something strange happened when we tried to shoot one particle at a time. This way, multiple particles with wave-like properties cannot interfere with each other. Even so, when one particle was fired at a time, we still observed an interference pattern. The interesting thing that is happening is each particle is arriving at a specific spot on the back screen, meaning they seem to be acting like little bits of matter, not as waves of energy. However, after several particles are fired individually, an interference pattern starts to emerge. But how could that be if they are going through individually and not interfering with each other? The conclusion was reached. Each particle goes through not as a wave of energy, but as a wave of potentialities a wave of all the possible paths it could take, interferes with itself, knowing which are the most likely landing spots and which are the least likely, and then collapses to one definite position once it is observed on the back film. In other words, all the possible paths exist simultaneously in a mathematical sense until the particle collapses to one location and it's observed on the back film. So physicists attempted to figure out what was happening at the double slit. They placed a measuring device there. But when they did this, the particles changed how they behaved and acted like tiny balls, revealing a pattern of two bands. The very act of observing at the slit, or having knowledge of the path the particles took, caused them to behave differently. What we chose to measure, whether to check to find out which slit they went through, or check to see which pattern they formed on the back film, determines the way the particles act and behave. Thus, physicists inferred nothing was physically certain until an observer made a measurement. 
This was the same conclusion we saw with the formulation of the Schrodinger equation. To better explain this, in the quantum enigma, Bruce Rosenblum and Fred Kuttner explain with a simple scenario representing what is actually happening. If we were to take an electron and isolate it in a superposition of two boxes and open one box, the electron would collapse in either one or the other. So if you don't see it in one, it will definitely exist in the other. However, if you were to take another pair of boxes and open them both simultaneously, the electron would come out of both as a spread out wave. It would display the wave of potentialities as an actual spread out wave, like what we saw with the double slit experiment when we do not place a measuring device to observe one slit. The key to understanding what is happening is that matter doesn't exist as a wave of energy prior to observation, but as a wave of mathematical potentialities. The waviness in a region is the probability of finding the object in a particular place. We must be careful. The waviness is not the probability of the object being in a particular place. There is a crucial difference here. The object was not there before you found it there. In other words, prior to measurement, experimental results and the mathematical formalism implies there is no physical particle there. Measurement causes the wave function, the mathematical probability, to collapse and reveal the physical particle, but nothing was physically there prior to measurement. As Heisenberg said, in the experiments about atomic events, we have to do with things and facts, the phenomena that are just as real as any phenomena in daily life. But the atoms and elementary particles themselves are not real. They form a world of potentialities or possibilities rather than one of things or facts. The conception of objective reality of the elementary particles has thus evaporated not into the cloud of some obscure new reality concept, but into the transparent clarity of a mathematics that represents no longer the behavior of particles, but rather our knowledge of this behavior. Many suggested this may only be the case with really small particles. But later experiments only demonstrated the same results with atoms and even larger clumps of atoms. When Anton Zellinger was asked where the limit was, his reply was, budget. All of matter is governed by the strange rules of quantum mechanics. Even though decoherence produces the appearance of the classical world, the rules of quantum mechanics would still apply at the fundamental level for all of matter. Decades ago, when this was first discovered, many scientists could not handle the philosophical implications. It just seemed too bizarre to be true. Many physicists like Niels Bohr ignored the philosophical implications and encouraged the practical approach to quantum mechanics. In other words, do not worry about the philosophical problems, just focus on the fact that it works. But some like Einstein and Schrodinger were deeply troubled by the results of quantum mechanics. So in 1935, Einstein and two of his colleagues came up with a thought experiment to debunk quantum mechanics. They proposed if you place two particles in a joint superposition and then separated them with a great distance, an observation of one would instantly affect the other, which Einstein called a spooky action at a distance. The point was that information between the two could not travel faster than the speed of light, so there must be some sort of undiscovered hidden variable that was actually causing the strange results of quantum mechanics, and not observation itself. That matter acted independent of observation, and only appeared to be observation dependent from our perspective. However, in the 1960s, John Bell began to explore this thought experiment and proposed an inequality. If this inequality was shown to be false, then the local hidden variable theories would be falsified and matter would be dependent on observation. This was put to experimental test in 1982 by Alan Aspect, and the results confirmed Bell's predictions. Bell's inequality was violated. This confirmed what quantum mechanics was telling us. Prior to measurement, objects have no defined properties or location. The act of an observer creates the existence of the physical objects and the properties they entail. Who deserves to trust their intuition more than Einstein. And Einstein's intuition told him, like everybody's intuition tells them, that things are really there when you're not looking at them. Well, he was wrong, right? <laughs> you know, th that intuition is incorrect. To avoid this, many like John Bell proposed the existence of non-local hidden variables and the existence of Leggett's inequality. However, in 2007, they were also falsified, this time by Anton Zellinger and his team. 
Then in 2013, the last testable loophole was closed, showing there are no classes left of testable hidden variables. The collapse of the wave function and the existence of physical particles clearly must depend on the observer, not on some unknown hidden variable somewhere in nature. So recent experiments led by a group at the University of Vienna, Austria, provide the most compelling evidence yet that there is no objective reality beyond what we observe. So it's really the observation that creates the reality. And what they found is that Leggett's inequality is violated as well as Bell's. Even if you allow for instantaneous influences, quantum measurements do not fit with the idea of an objective reality. So as they say in, in the magazine, rather than passively observing it, we in fact create reality. And then on top of this, the coach inspector theorem was experimentally confirmed in 2011. The philosophical implications also support the notion physical reality is not there without an observer, as Anton Zellinger explains. The coach inspector theorem talks about properties of one system only. So we know that we cannot, assume, to put it precisely, we know that it is wrong to assume that the features of a system which we observe in the measurement exist prior to the measurement. Not always, I mean in certain cases. So in a sense, uh, what we perceive as reality now depends on our earlier decision what to measure. Which is a very, very deep uh, message about, about the nature of reality and about our role in the universe. We are not just passive observers. In other words, the coach inspector theorem confirms the notion of reality is dependent on observation. You can't separate observers from reality, like the idea of watching nature play out on a stage. Our actions now very much determine the results, especially the collapse of the wave function and the existence of particles in their physical form. This only correlates with the conclusions of this study, which shows objectivity, determinism, and independence combined are incompatible with any theory about the universe, and not only with quantum mechanics, but with classical approaches as well. In other words, you can't have a universe that is objective, deterministic, and also independent from observers, as we once thought. All the data has confirmed this through multiple experiments, that reality is dependent on observers. Whether it is the interaction-free experiments, Cheshire Cat experiments, delayed choice quantum eraser experiments, with subatomic particles, or even atoms, or even non-local delayed choice quantum eraser experiments, where the measuring devices were separated by several kilometers. All this has led to the conclusion that physical reality is dependent on there being an observer to collapse the wave function. Now, as we said earlier, many have suggested and still attempt to say this is only true of the quantum world, but not the macro world. Pragmatically, this is true, but it doesn't change the fact that everything is built on atoms, the very particles that are dependent on observation. Thus, the fundamental nature of reality is dependent on observation. Second. The reason we do not see the results is because atoms are so tiny that their probability spread is so small we would never notice a change. Also, there are decoherence effects, as we explained in this video. And finally, even with these facts, we still have observed quantum effects with macro objects, if they are isolated from decoherence. In 2009, physicists at the University of California demonstrated quantum entanglement between two aluminum chips, big enough to be seen by the naked eye. In 2010, the largest object ever put in a quantum superposition was a small metal paddle, which was demonstrated to be in motion and motionless at the same time. We have actually seen this numerous times, so you cannot separate the quantum world from the macro world. As Anton Zellinger said, the only limit is budget. Others have opted to save the classical world with different interpretations, but we have critiqued these in other videos and have shown they are either not complete or entirely ad hoc in their attempts to get around these implications. So what about Niels Bohr's approach? That the wave function is not real, but it's just a mathematical tool which represents our lack of knowledge about the system. This was recently experimentally challenged though. The results gave strong evidence the wave function is true for reality and actually real, not just an epistemic tool. The true nature of reality is the wave function, an observation causes it to collapse to physical particles. Some also try to suggest that interaction and decoherence can adequately explain the collapse of the wave function. But we address this in our video The Measurement Problem and demonstrate this is not true, as interactions create a chain that eventually goes back to an actual observer. 
This radical implication cannot just be ignored by saying it stopped with the first interaction. The same quantum rules apply to the particles that make up the measuring apparatus. So you need something else to collapse the particles for that apparatus, and so on and so on. The chain keeps going back until you get to something that is not bound by the same rules. And as physicist John von Neumann identified, the only logical place to stop this chain is with the one who is ultimately performing the measurement, the conscious observer. These implications show consciousness is not a product of physical interactions in the brain, because if it was, it would also need to be collapsed as well. But the evidence implies the need for something, not bound by the same laws of quantum mechanics, which can cause the ultimate collapse for all of matter. Otherwise, there is no logical explanation for what causes collapse in the existence of matter. So if experiments show an observer is needed to cause collapse, and all of matter is bound by these same rules, then the most logical inference is consciousness is ultimately and philosophically the cause of the collapse of the wave function, and the physical existence of matter itself. Quantum mechanics, the very fundamental nature of reality, leads us to the idea consciousness is not physical and is more real than matter itself. The evidence infers there is no escape. We have to face the reality that the physical makeup of space-time is dependent on conscious observers. As Eugene Wigner said, the laws of quantum mechanics cannot be formulated without recourse to the concept of consciousness. Henry Stapp says, The solution hinges not on quantum randomness, but rather on the dynamical effects within quantum theory of the intention and attention of the observer. Stephen Barr says, Human beings are observers, and perhaps the only observers. This fact clearly has potentially huge implications for the question of whether the human mind is entirely reducible to physics and mathematics. The very fundamental nature of matter implies consciousness is not a product of it, but that the opposite is true. Physical matter is a product of consciousness, thus leading to an idealistic or dualistic approach to reality. The physical universe is a product of mind, and the very fundamental pieces of reality require an observer. The old view of materialism is inadequate in fitting the data. There are simply no hidden variables and no interpretation of quantum mechanics that cannot account for the data without being ad hoc. Reality is dependent on conscious observers. As Nobel Prize winner Eugene Wigner said, while a number of philosophical ideas may be logically consistent with present quantum mechanics, materialism is not.